The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Managing New and Problematic Field Crop Diseases in the Midwest. My name is Julia Freuk. I am the project coordinator here at the Partnership for Ag Resource Management and will be hosting the webinar this morning. We are joined today by my colleague, Mark Adelsberger, Resource Management Specialist, who will provide a brief introduction. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Nathan Klicheski, Research Assistant Professor and Extension Field Crop Pathologist at the University of Illinois. Before we begin, I will go over some brief logistics. Please remember to submit questions for Dr. Klicheski on the GoToWebinar panel during his presentation. I will moderate the questions for approximately 10 minutes after the presentation. You will receive an email in the next few days with the webinar recording and link to the webinar evaluation. The recording will also be available on partnershipfarm.org and YouTube. By attending today's webinar, you are eligible for 1.5 CCA continuing education units, one for integrated pest management and 0.5 for crop management. You must be present for the entire webinar to receive those points. If you submitted your CCA number at registration and are watching the webinar live, no further action is required to submit your CEUs. If you are watching this on demand at a later date, please, watch, please be sure to watch the entire presentation through the GoToWebinar platform and not YouTube to receive credit. If you watch the webinar recording more than two weeks after the original broadcast, please email your CCA number to julia at partnershipfarm.org to ensure your credits are submitted. Please make a big note that credits often take a few weeks to appear in your account. If it has been more than four weeks, please contact my email. And now, with the logistics taken care of, I will turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Julia. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we really, really appreciate you being here. Uh, the Partnership for Ag Resource Management, or PARM, is an effort of our nonprofit IPM Institute of North America, along with many other projects in agriculture and communities, each focused on using the power of the marketplace to improve outcomes in health, environment, and economics, all key elements of sustainability. We're all aware of the water quality challenges we face, from the record-breaking algal blooms in the Western Lake Erie Basin to the expansive hypoxic zones in the Gulf of Mexico. We also know agriculture is a major contributor to these issues. The graph on the left shows the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's annual data on algal bloom severity in the Western Lake Erie Basin since 2002. On average, blooms are becoming more severe and the size of the hypoxic zone is still much larger than the task force goal of 5,000 square kilometers, making it increasingly important for the ag industry to step up and showcase their positive efforts to retain nutrients on fields. Our goal at PARM is to collaborate with ag retailers to promote, track, and report on profitable products and services that keep inputs on cropland. Through retail sales, we, we estimate nutrient loss reductions based on peer-reviewed studies. These estimates are variable due to factors like slope, soil type, and weather, but give our participants an idea of where they can likely make a difference. We track sales through annual surveys and provide both aggregate re public reports and confidential individual nutrient stewardship reports. The ag retailers we partner with in the Great Lakes and Upper Mississippi River Basin states are working hard to improve water quality. Our survey shows, our, our survey results show average increases in variable rate phosphorus application, cover crops, and more. The PARM project currently has 90 ag retailer participants representing over 5.3 million acres. To become a member, visit our website, partnershipfarm.org, and see how we can help you promote your sustainability efforts. With that, I'll turn it back to Julia. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, our team also provides several free resources for egg retailers, grower clients, and consultants. On the left is our continually updated and 4R approved agronomist handbook, available free for download. 
our phosphorus loss reduction wall cards are on the left lower left corner can also be ordered for free on our website. PARM also offers several incentive programs for ag retailers. We are currently offering a cover crop incentive program and VRT program for retailers in specific watersheds. Find out more under the Ag Retailer tab on our website. Our next webinar in the Great Lakes Conservation Connect series airs September 5th, and we'll discuss next generation farming. Look for announcements in your email on, and on Facebook and Twitter. We are also airing a new webinar in our pollinator series in late September, covering honeybees and agriculture. Please remember, we take into consideration your suggestions for webinar topics, so be sure to fill out our evaluation form after the webinar. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for PARM updates and industry news. Today's webinar is sponsored by Sustainability Programming for Ag Retailers and CCAs, or SPARC. SPARC is a partnership between the Agricultural Retailers Associ Association the American Society of Agronomy, Environmental Defense Fund, and Field to Market. We will now hear from Jamie Powers from the Environmental Defense Fund, who will provide a brief introduction on SPARC. Great, thanks, Julia. Um, thanks to, oh, let me show my screen here. Thanks, Julia. Thanks to PARM for uh, letting me speak today. The last webinar, for PARM about a month ago, dealt with kind of an overview of Spark and what we offer. Uh, today, we thought we would focus on why ag retail companies are good partners in conservation, sustainability, stewardship, et cetera. Um, as Julia said, my name is Jamie Powers. I work for Environmental Defense Fund in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and I'm also a member of the steering committee for Spark. Um, my contact information is at the end of the presentation. So why should ag retailers be included in this conversation? So there are at least several, several reasons. Um, one is that they're a trusted guidance uh, source for growers. When we think about the decisions that are being made on farm, including conservation and stewardship, ag retailers are a ubiquitous source of knowledge and advice, uh, and that would be a great thing to tap into. They already have a number of products and services that support or enhance conservation efforts. Uh, they have regular, consistent, and usually strong and trusted relationships with their growers. Uh, and they have a lot of influence over whether certain conservation practices are adopted or set aside. Uh, and of course, many ag retail companies are large and have the ability to reach hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of growers. So as we think about uh, the importance of ag retailers in reaching scale across the country with some of these practice, some of these problems and practices, ag retailers can be a great resource. So they're already helping growers improve operational efficiency. It's just part of what they do. So I know that not everybody, in fact, maybe most participants in this webinar are not employed by ag retail firms, um, but it's important to think about this operational efficiency as something that can be promoted in the context of sustainability discussions. Um, one of the points we make in our Spark materials is that there are a number of products and services already on offer uh, that can be uh, bundled in different ways or at least serve as a starting point for ag retailers to be an active participant in conser conservation conversations. So how can those of you that are not ag retailers uh, engage with those companies to help improve environmental outcomes? Uh, this is context dependent. There are many states where agribusinesses uh, and ag retailers in particular are playing a really active and progressive role in how they engage with growers and others on conservation. Recommend you check with your state agribusiness association to see what's already happening. Uh, they are a primary audience for workshops, field days, and other events. When you think about uh, organizing a, an event that is focused on conservation, consider reaching out to ag retailers and then encourage them to bring growers. This can achieve a couple things. It already hits on the scale point that I made earlier. 
but it also allows them to be sitting there together, growers and the advisors that they work with. And so if they have a question about how something the workshop is talking about applies to their fields, they can just turn to their advisor and find out right then and there how it applies or doesn't, or if they have a question about how it works in their environment, they can have their, their trusted partner right there with them. Uh, if there are supply chain sustainability projects in your area, and you know of people involved, encourage them to engage with ag retailers for some of the same reasons I just mentioned. They're gonna help the, the practices that are involved in that project really take root uh, and be more sustainably implemented. Um, and finally, share Spark resources with ag retailers that you are aware of or that you already work with and encourage them to reach out to us for more information. And I'm going to breeze through the rest of these slides real quickly. A lot of this was covered in the last webinar, so I encourage you to check out that recording. Here's the mission and vision uh, of Spark. Important to note that we're pre-competitive, so we're not looking to set up one company over others, but that we're trying to make resources available for everybody in the sector uh, to benefit from. So some of the things that we have are online learning modules. Uh, and I'll show you where you can get these uh, in just a moment. This is the list of the primary modules that we offer. We have a manual that accompanies those modules for teams that are going through the modules together. This allows for retail companies and others to make the material more uh, locally relevant and contextually relevant as well. We have these fact sheets that companies can brand with their own logo and include in their company material on a variety of conservation issues. We did a number of farmer uh, case studies making the business case for conservation practices, different geographies, different crops, um, and we're currently, EDF is currently working on an ag retail business case as well to really raise up how ag retailers can benefit from this work. Uh, every issue of Crops and Soils that you'll see this year has something in there from Spark where we try to get into detail on a specific topic. Uh, you can reach any of these resources at the ARA website, the ASA website, or the Field to Market website. Uh, and finally, this is our contact information. I'm in the upper right. If you have any questions about anything that came up today, I'd be happy to answer that for you. And uh, Julia, thank you so much for your time. Back to you. Okay. Thank you, Jamie and Spark, for being our sponsor today. And now we'll get the presentation started with Dr. Nathan Klicheski, Research Assistant Professor and Extension Field Crop, field crop Pathologist at the University of Illinois. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here today. I have a lot of good information um, that I'm going to be sharing with everybody here. And uh, I hope I can get through it in an uh, effective manner. Uh, glad to hear that things are going to be recorded. I would encourage you to go back and, and uh, you know, listen to this again if there's something you've missed. And just also want to encourage you, my information uh, is here on this front slide. If you have a question, uh, you can feel free to contact me via email, via Twitter, and I'll do my best to help you with your plant disease needs or put you in contact with somebody that might be more appropriate in your given area or crop um, crop area. So that being said, I'm going to start out today and just talk a little bit about plant disease management from a from a general perspective. Okay, and and let's think about what are plant diseases. Now, a, a disease, as we know, is is something that is going to be causing reduced yield, growth, um, et cetera, et cetera, over time, and it's due to a continuous irritant. And those irritants are pathogens and these pathogens that we deal with in our field crop systems include fungi, fungal-like organisms, things like Pythium, Phytophthora, for example, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, and there's also some other things that we can sometimes uh, deal with that are considered pathogens um, I'm not going to talk about today, such as parasitic plants like daughter, for example. Now what these pathogens do is they'll tap into the plants and feed on them and the main effect is that they're going to reduce nutrient uptake or the ability of the plants to produce photosynthates, which obviously are, are sugars that are used for energy. 
And um, when that happens, you're going to have reduced yields, growth, et cetera, et cetera. Also, they can cause direct damage to tissues, which can affect the plants. And there's other, other ways that they can impact plants and, and their productivity as well. Now, plant diseases, as we, we, we talk about these, we need to realize that plant diseases are not something that just come out of the blue. You actually need uh, what we call uh, the disease triangle um, to, to be involved here. And what that disease triangle is, is it's a combination of the correct host, a susceptible host, the correct or conducive environment, and the correct pathogen. And when all three of those things come together, you get disease. Um, the amount of disease you're going to get depends on the amount of time that those three factors are kept together. Um, and, and therefore, we can't expect that once we have a host there um, that we're going to get a disease. We need to have the right environment and the right pathogen. So if we talk about what a, a correct host is, um, this would be something like the correct species, for example. Some pathogens are only pathogenic on corn or wheat. Um, some actually have multiple hosts, and, and um, they can be problematic on multiple species that are related. Cultivars, growth stages, as I'm going to talk to you here. Um, some diseases will only affect in early in the disease or in crop growth. Some only infect later during reproductive cycles. All those things are going to be important. In terms of the environment, we have to think about the temperature, the moisture, especially rain, this could be soil moisture, it could be moisture and the humidity, the quantity and amount of light, all these other things are going to contribute to um, the ability of the pathogen to cause disease. And then the pathogen itself uh, has to be the right species, it has to be the right uh, type of pathogen to cause disease on the host of interest. And we have different designations for this, pathovar, race, uh, they also have to be aggressive, which means that they, they cause disease um, and can cause a significant amount of disease. So all, all of our pathogenic species can vary in how aggressive they are. And also they have to be in the right growth stage as well. So some of these, these fungi need to be a particular age or experience specific uh, con environmental conditions to allow them to become pathogenic or cause disease on a host. Now, when I talk about disease management, some things to keep in mind here is that our field crops get disease. And having disease on field crops, even though producers might not like to see plants that aren't perfectly green from the base of the plant all the way up uh, to the very tip, what we have to keep in mind is a lot of our field crops here are very tough. And they're going to get some diseases, but the amount of disease won't necessarily impact their uh, bottom line or the ability of that plant to yield um, yield uh, at an appropriate amount or the expected amount. So if we talk about this in terms of uh, disease progress over time, I have this kind of generic little graph that I've put together here. The amount of disease that you're going to get from a pathogen on the y-axis and then the time during the grow growing season on the x-axis, uh, what we have is our economic damage threshold. So that's the amount of damage that a plant is going to experience um, and anything above that is going to cause a, a reduction in yield that's going to cause significant losses for our growers. And when I talk about managing diseases, what we want to do is keep that, that curve, which would be, um, if we think of these disease curves, that blue line would be a disease that starts early in the season. It starts to progress, and that economic, economic damage threshold is met very early in, in the season, and therefore it can have more impact on yield. What we want to do is we want to promote practices that push that, that curve to the right. And the further to the right we push it, uh, the less likely that we're going to hit that economic uh, damage threshold and have issues uh, uh, that are going to cause yield losses for our, our growers. In general, there are different ways of managing disease, and we want to be trying to integrate these, these uh, practices to come up with an integrated management plan. Uh, the first thing that we talk about are cultural practices. These are things such as crop rotation. And as I mentioned, some pathogens are very specific. So if you remove the host, if you say you have a corn uh, disease very specific to corn, you remove that host, plant into soybeans the next year, uh, that pathogen no longer has something to feed on. And then you have an entire year out of corn where other organisms can feed on that, that particular pathogen. 
Um, perhaps the pathogen doesn't survive very well for a year out of a host, something like that. We, are, we reduce the amount of that pathogen in the soil. For some of our organisms, tillage is an option, and especially these are ones that might overwinter on residue and produce spores or structures on that residue that then are launched into the canopy of the plants. Things like white mold um, or, or gray leaf spot on corn all produce structures on the surface of the soil or on the residue that will produce spores. So by burying, um, burying that residue, those spores cannot reach the plant canopy, and it also allows that residue to decompose. And when that residue decomposes, the pathogen goes with it oftentimes. Now, of course, these things don't work with every single disease, but these are just some general um, options that we have from a cultural standpoint. Biological control, that's doing, uh, utilizing a, a living host to control our plant pathogens. And there's a couple of those that, that we can use sometimes in our, uh, our uh, field crops. One would be cover crops. Some of these cover crops might produce exudates or chemicals in their tissues that can actually uh, reduce certain plant pathogens in soils. Green manures, which would be adding kind of as biological uh, manure additive to increase organic matter and promote the growth of com competitive species in the soil that can uh, sometimes reduce the amount of disease ex expressed. And then biological organisms. And this is something that uh, a lot of our, our companies are starting to get into, especially with seed treatments. One example I like to bring up here is a Clariva seed treatment, which is a, a microbe called Pasturia penetrans. And that actually feeds on soybean cyst nematode cysts. So it's very specific to soybean cyst nematode, which is one of our biggest pathogens in soybeans. Host resistance is a big option for us uh, 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 for managing diseases. There's very specific resistance that can totally reduce the amount of disease that you see for a particular pathogen and also more general resistance um, that can maybe slow the growth of a pathogen. And when we look at our, our selection for various uh, diseases, we want to make sure that we're paying attention to what hybrid variety cultivar we selected and know its strengths and weaknesses, because that's going to tell us what diseases we may encounter on that particular field or, or when we're planting with a particular variety cultivar, um, so on and so forth, hybrid. And then the last thing is chemical. These are things such as fungicides, nematostats or nematocides. We don't really utilize too many nematocides, at least in the Midwest any longer, but in, in the South, they do have some options for nematocides and furrow um, and defense inducers. And those are things that are going to be stimulating the plant uh, um, to increase the, the, the compounds and components that help actively defend its tissues. Some general notes on fungicides that I like to bring up. Um, when we're talking about integrated crop management, the fungicides are, are good tools when they're used properly. And remember that they're going to be reducing the growth, reproduction, and impact of some plant pathogens, and that different fungicide modes of action are more or less effective on different plant pathogens. So it's important to read your labels um, and to go through as much information as you can um, to make sure that you're applying a fungicide that will be useful on the, on the fungus that you're trying to control. The most common ones we have in field crops are foliar and seed treatments, and they typically provide about three weeks of protection. Uh, definitely two weeks, that third week is, is hit or miss, and, and depending on the environment, that may have a little bit of um, wiggle room to it, okay? So that's the amount of protection you're getting there. They do not increase your yields, but they will, they will um, minimize the yield loss due to these fungal diseases, okay? So our crops have built-in a uh, yield potential and the maximum yield potential and then these diseases can reduce that amount of yield potential in a particular situation and, and by the uh, application of fungicides we can minimize that, that yield loss. So when we're constructing a management plan for managing our field um, crop diseases the first part of your management plan needs to be knowing what diseases you're dealing with. And I'm not talking about just going and driving, um, driving past the field with your truck and saying, oh, that looks sick. Um, or even just going into your field and taking a picture and guessing what the disease is. We need to positively identify the diseases that are problematic in our fields. This means regular scouting and also means sending samples to your state plant diagnostic clinics. So these are going to be 
Um, every state will have, have one. I have here the University of Illinois uh, plant clinic page. Um, send in your samples. They're going to have an expert there who's going to be trained in identifying diseases, and they will give you back a report that will tell you what you have on your plants. Then you want to be able to understand how, what the pathogen is and how it works, and then utilize integrated management to help reduce disease in a profitable manner. So, so that's what we're going to be talking about with these disease um, examples I have today, which are kind of new or in, uh, diseases that are becoming more problematic for us in the Midwest. So the first one is tar spot on corn. Tar spot actually comes from Latin America. It was first documented in Mexico way back in the early 1900s in 1904. And in, in Mexico and parts of Latin America and the Caribbean where it's found regularly um, on their hybrids under their conditions, it can cause upwards of 50% yield loss. The yield loss is due to direct um, reduction in carbohydrates or sugars due to uh, the pathogen attacking the foliage and reducing the ability for the plant to produce photosynthates. Um, the, re the result of this is that the plants will dry down more quickly. And as we know, if we've got a plant that hasn't quite finished uh, what it's supposed to do, that's going to reduce your yield potential there. And anytime we have significant reductions in photosynthate during active periods of grain fill, uh, what that can do is actually result in the plant pulling carbohydrates and starch stores from the roots and from the stalks and using those to fill the ear because its met, uh, needs aren't being met by the foliage and that can actually reduce or weaken those tissues um, and cause them to be invaded by other organisms and that results in lodging or increased lodging potential later on in the year. Tar spot is caused by what we know uh, what we call an obligate pathogen, Phylocoromatis, so it needs a green living host to grow and reproduce. Phylocoromatis is the only species of this one, uh, this particular fungus to infect corn, but there are other phylocora species that infect other grasses and ornamental plants. So you might see tar spot symptoms on other plants, probably going to be caused by a different species. If you look in your field, what you're going to see are black raised structures, and the, the term for these structures are stromata. You'll find them on the foliage and on the husks most often. They're black. Um, they, they will be a uh, range in size from these small pinhead structures to more elo elongated diamond shaped stromata. And you may or may not have this kind of fisheye look to these lesions. You can see on that top picture there how you have those black spots and then around them are these necrotic, necrotic lesions. Um, you have, uh, within each of those spots, you're going to have several spore producing structures They'll actually extrude or exude those spores in a mucilaginous substance. That's what you're seeing there, that, that orangish goobery looking thing that's actually going to be filled of, of ascospores. And those ascospores are actually going to be what causes new infections on your green tissues. We don't believe that this is a seed borne disease. There's no evidence of that. Although everything we're finding out is that we're, we're basically starting from scratch with this disease in terms of figuring out um, the pathogen, how it works. And everything like that. So you really don't know a lot about this disease and this pathogen. Symptom-wise, this is what you're going to see in the field. You can see the, the foliage there, those brown raised structures. They will not wipe off uh, when, you, when you have water and you rub on them. They won't come off. They won't leave any kind of dust on your fingers. If you get out early in the morning and it's wet enough, you can actually see those little mucilaginous um, exit is coming out of the inside of those black structures. That's what you're seeing here. So you'd have to come out in a field early in the day and probably have a pretty nice hand lens to see these sorts of um, signs here of the particular disease. In 2018, we actually had a, a pretty major outbreak of tar spot in the Midwest. It affected a pretty good slew of our corn produ uh, producing states. And it's been here actually in the United States since 2015, but last year was the first year where we actually saw yield losses. And in Illinois, these range from 10 to, to 40 bushels per acre. Um, in parts of Michigan, actually, it, it was upwards of 60 bushels per acre in some of these uh, cases. So we're talking significant yield losses where it did occur. Um, reduced yields, faster senescence and lodging, all those other things that, that I talked about earlier. Um, in many cases, just because of the, the types of conditions that favor this disease, there are also issues with other plant diseases like gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight, urots. And so it was hard in many cases to um, state exactly what kind of yield losses were due just to tar spot versus the combination of multiple diseases 
affecting the plant at once. In terms of this disease and how it works, as I said, you have to understand how the disease works to manage it. This, this tends to be a cool, a disease that likes a cool and very wet. Okay, so if we're talking 60 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, seven hours of leaf wetness at night and greater than 75% relative humidity, um, that's when you're going to start to see the disease start to show up. And in general, and, and this is just something that, that I've observed, it seems like the at least the initial onset of this disease tends to be associated with canopy closure. Once those canopies close, then we start to see it build up on the on the base of the plant. And if you get a lot of rain, um, kind of like what you know, I'm in Wisconsin right now, I just got hit with a storm last night. These cool temperatures are perfect for tar spot to start a t start and take off. Um, so you get those rains, the, the leaves stay wet, and then you're going to see the spores will extrude out of those structures, be moved to new parts of the plants, and then infect. So they're reduced, uh, released at night. Um, this is something that's probably going to be moving at least field to field. We don't know a lot about it after the fact, but we know it can move meters, you know, feet to meters. And I do know that it's going to be overwintering in our, our fields on residue as those black stromata in the structure. So when you have corn residue on the surface of your fields, that's going to be where this disease is at least initially going to be starting in the following year. Okay, and so we proved that here in Illinois. It's a recent publication of mine uh, that was just, just uh, released this past month. And then we also have been working with Damon Smith Group at the University of Wisconsin uh, to look at residues from fields that had tar spot last year uh, to see if, if there are differences in how well those spores germinate in water. And so in this particular case here on the x-axis, I have different counties or samples, DeKalb, Bureau County, uh, samples from the lab in LaSalle County. And I, I measured these spores that were extracted from those stromata uh, four hours and 24 hours later. And these were collected in March, 2019 from fields that were infected in 2018. And our lab samples were uh were collected in September 2018, allowed to dry and just left at air temperature or room temperature, I should say, until assessing these approximately three weeks ago. And as you can see here, uh, at 24 hours, we start to see that, that yes, we do get spore germination. So this is providing further evidence uh, that this organism does overwinter on the residue and that that can be a viable source of inoculum um, for the upcoming season. So residue management could be part of our management program. In terms of the disease cycle and how this disease works, as I mentioned, it's going to be starting overwintering on our residue as those black structures. We don't know how long it'll overwinter on that residue, but at least one year. When it gets wet, those canopies are closed and we have those kind of cooler, cooler temperatures. Uh, that's when we're going to see the spores released. Those will infect the, the foliage and husks. Um, it takes a, at least two weeks, maybe longer, after infection before you'll actually see those stromata develop. So you can come in at the beginning of a month, not see symptoms on a leaf, um, have dry weather, and then come back three weeks later and see, see those spots form. And you think well, that doesn't make sense. It's been dry, but it's because that infection took place two, three weeks earlier when the conditions were conducive. And then we are assuming, and, and again, we know this from some of the work we're doing, that under the appropriate conditions, that cycle will repeat itself. So each of those stroma can, can produce hundreds, if not a couple thousand spores. And if we have the same conditions over and over like we did last year, rain after rain, you'll get what we call secondary cycles that cause more disease. That infected tissue then gets taken and, and when you harvest, goes back onto the surface of your soil and that's going to be the source of inoculum for the next season. I mentioned last year, was a big year for tar spot and initially this disease was detected in a couple of counties in Indiana and northern Illinois and that was in 2015 and this is where we had it as of last year. And you can see we've got a pretty good portion there around um, Lake Michigan. We also have some in Florida as well that's been confirmed. In terms of our hybrid response, uh, we've shown that we do see some, some differences in maturity those early, earlier maturing hybrids are less, or seem to be less affected um, by the disease than the late maturing hybrids. Um, that is probably going to be a result of the fact that those early maturing hybrids are finishing up and require less time to, to finish and therefore can, 
the effects of the disease are less likely to impact them relative to the late maturing hybrids. Um, one thing that we do know right now is that we don't have a lot of knowledge in terms of tolerance or susceptibility, or sorry, resistance to this particular disease in our commercial germplasm because it, it, it's something that was not on the radar for screening. So this is an example of what I was talking about or what I am talking about here is if we look at each of these hybrids and they're just numbered here from one of my uniform variety trials, we have 98 hybrids and you can see most of them are going to be pretty darn uh, susceptible to this disease. Um, but there are a couple on that left side that statistically did a little bit better. And we, we, we still see disease um, but it's not nearly as much as those that are on the right side of this graph. So selecting a hybrid with less susceptibility, at least initially until we start figuring out resistances pathogen, could be a way to help manage this particular disease. There are some fungicides that are labeled for tar spot because last year was the only year where we actually had enough to see yield responses. Um, we don't have a lot of data on these fungicides, uh, but these are the particular products that that do seem to have some some sort of uh, labeling and and therefore they have some evidence that they can suppress this disease. And if we look at the how some of these diseases perform, this is some disease data uh, from my colleague Martin Chilvers at Michigan State University. He had a trial where he uh, sprayed Headline, Proline, and Delaro versus an untreated control in a field study where they had about three percent disease severity last year. And he rated these at two different times, uh, about three weeks later at August 24th. And you can see no statistical differences amongst the products, although you see them kind of the untreated, you know, a little bit higher in disease severity relative to some of the other ones. But then when he came in later in the season around R5, uh, that's when he's really starting to see those particular um, products start to separate themselves out. So in this case, our untreated check was nearly 100% severity. Um, when he looked at the ear leaf and the ear leaf plus two, so two leaves above the ear leaf. But then as, as you look at these products, um, the QOI, strobular, and headline only, um, similar to the untreated check, but then proline and Delaro statistically reducing more disease uh, than headline. But what about yields in this particular case? And this is something that's really important. We reduced disease in that trial significantly but the impact of yield was not uh, evident. So you're not seeing a significant reduction in yield. And in that particular case, it's probably because, as I mentioned, he already had some disease when he made this application. And we also have that two to three week period where we don't see the infection that's already taken place. And so some of that yield loss already was kind of, uh, um, that yield loss already had taken place by this point. And so, this is why timing of application is going to be important when we manage our diseases too. A lot of our diseases, when you do apply a fungicide, you wanna get that fungicide on um, just before you start to see disease. And so we're working on some methods to help improve our management and application timing so that we only apply fungicides when they're most likely to be effective for managing this disease and we're not chasing it after the fact. Cultural practices for managing tar spot tillage to bury inoculum seems like it could work and you might see some local effects. We haven't any data on this yet, but in se um, seasons like this last year where it's rain, 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 there's gonna be so much inoculum out there that it's unlikely to have a major effect. But in some of these other years, you might actually see it push that curve a little further to the right, as I mentioned. Rotation out of corn seems like that could work, but again, how long? Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna be at least one year, if not more. And another thing we have to keep in mind with these cultural practices is if you are um, imposing these on your fields and your neighbors are not, they can still be, uh, their inoculum can potentially spread over to your field. However, it could spread over later in the season so the disease onset is at a later time and therefore you might not see as severe of yield losses. Hybrid selection is gonna be key. Um, selecting least susceptible hybrids. I think you're gonna get more data on that in the future. Fungicide, um, the fungicides that, that are labeled would be our recommended ones. They need to go on prior to disease onset. Scout, if you see this disease early in the season, prior to tassel, prior to VTR1, um, you need to be thinking about what, what you wanna do, if you wanna utilize a fungicide or not. Um, if you do 
have weather that's going to be conducive to disease, this is definitely something that can uh, sneak up on you pretty good. And so you need to make sure that you're making informed fungicide management decisions. Fusarium head blight and wheat is an example of another uh, disease that's a major problem in our field crops. This is caused by a fungus, Fusarium graminearum. Much like, I think much like tar spot, white molds in these diseases, it's very episodic, meaning that when the conditions are right, you'll see severe yield losses one year or in one region, and then you won't see it again for another three to five years. And I think that's what we're going to see with tar spot. I think that's what we're going to, or what we have seen with Fusarium head blight, at least for the last 15 years. It's very difficult to control. This is another residue borne disease. Um, and actually that pathogen infects corn as well, okay? So you talk about rotation, rotation of corn is not a very good, uh, or corn rotations aren't very good for managing Fusarium head blight, okay? So it's going to start in your residue. Um, when that, that residue, it gets warm and wet, the fungus starts to grow, it produces spores, and some of those spores will be launched into the atmosphere where they hang out. Um, some of those spores will be rain splashed onto the plant. And this is a disease that's only going to be problematic during the reproductive phase of growth. So early on, um, when, you, when you have foliage out and no heads popping out of your wheat, it's not a problem. It's only affecting the heads. It's only a problem in the heads. Uh, it infects those flowering spikes, causes our symptoms, which include bleaching um, and some toxin production. And then when you harvest, that's going back into your residue. You plant corn, it can build up again and cause some problems. So here's a animation in terms of how that is going to work. So you have your plant or your wheat, it's flowering, those anthers are coming out, there's sugars and some other things in those an anthers that actually help that spore germinate and they also provide a nice pathway um, to move into that head. It'll infect at those usually individual spikelets and then move into that central column called the rachis. Once it's in the rachis, it can, it can grow and actually restrict water and nutrient movement within the head, which causes that bleaching symptom. And then sometimes it also will uh, produce a toxin that we call Don or vomitoxin. And that's going to be very important, as I mentioned here in a second. Bleaching on the heads is uh, there's kind of some symptoms there. Usually there's an infection point, and then everything above that will bleach off. Oftentimes when you're looking for symptoms, you want to be going in about 18 to 24 days after flowering starts. That's when we start to see uh, the symptoms really develop and you're able to, to kind of uh, separate out you know, fields that are heavily infected from ones that aren't. Um, they will also produce what we call tombstones. So infected grains here on the left um, and on the right are, are healthy kernels, okay? So that's... Um, you can kind of see that reduction in growth there too. Now, oops, sorry, I got something going on. Here we go. But as I mentioned before, it's not just um, yield loss that's important with this disease. So the reduction of kernel weight to the, the bleaching, that's, that's an issue. But the bigger issue, at least in my opinion, is the production of vomitoxin or deoxinobionol. So what now you can probably guess, and I put that picture there to make it very obvious what this toxin can do. Uh, feed refusal, weight loss. Um, actually, if it gets into food production, you're making beer or something like that, it can have very similar effects on, on humans. Okay, so if, you, if you're drinking a wheat beer and you start to feel sick, uh, blame it on the vomit toxin, not on the fact that you drank too much beer. Um, it's measured in parts per million. And our dockage, when we're trying to sell this stuff, starts at two parts per million. That's not very much. And if we're trying to make our premiums and sell to a market for human consumption, we, you know, this is something that's a major problem for us. And the biggest thing for, for me when I talk to people about head blight is you can have vomitoxin without those bleaching symptoms. Okay, so if that, that fungus infects and you've got a, a variety um, that flowered early, it can still infect the heads later on and produce vomitoxin. And those kernels can be healthy. They can look great. And then you'll go and you'll, you'll take your truck over um, and try to sell that grain. They'll put some probes in there. They'll do a vomitoxin test and it's elevated. And then you're going to get docked. And if you have too much, much vomitoxin, you, they might refuse your entire lot. OK, they might they might just say, we don't want this. And that happens in bad years where you get people driving around 
um, from mill to mill trying to find one that'll accept their load and then sometimes they just have to dump it out in their fields and compost it or something like that because they can't sell it. So these are some of our advisory levels for animals that's established by the USDA and you can see here human consumption we gotta we got the we gotta be below one part per million and then if we want to sell it for some of our animals we we got to get it below five parts per million so it's still pretty low so when i talk about managing fusarium head blood i really talk about managing vomitoxin and my goal as an extension plant pathologist is to keep people uh, from having to dump out their grain it's nice if we can sell it to the to the uh, human consumption market um, i think everyone wants to make the most money that they can but some years that's just not possible and we want to minimize the amount of, of trucks that are just dumping their grain out because they have excessive vomit toxins. So when I talk about managing this disease, I'm really talking about managing vomit toxin. And it's a very difficult disease to control, so we need to utilize an integrated management. The two best tools we have to manage this disease are moderately resistant varieties and uh, uh, labeled fungicides applied at the correct timing and in the correct manner. And I'll talk about that here as I go through um, this particular chat. So what we're looking at here, this is a, um, a paper that was published in Plant Disease in 2012 um, by, by some colleagues that we work with fairly closely. And this is a summary of over 40 trials that were conducted in 12 states from 2007 through 2010. And what you're looking at here is the combination response of the use of a moderately resistant or moderately susceptible wheat variety relative to a fully susceptible variety combined with um, a uh, labeled fungicide applied at the proper timing, okay? Now, the susceptible, you can see if you look at those orange bars, that's going to have the fungicide applied, and then the yellow bar is no fungicide. So what we want to look at here is let's just look at the yellow bars. And you can see if you plant a susceptible variety, you're not going to get any control, but if you plant a moderately susceptible to moderately resistant variety, you can have upwards of 40 to 50% reduction in um, foliar, or sorry, visual symptoms on the head just due to planting uh, a variety that has more resistance. Now, what I will say, this is these are old data, right? 2007 to 2010. I don't really think, at least in the Midwest, we have much that we would consider to be fully susceptible to head blight. So nowadays, I think we have more moderately susceptible varieties out there, um, and then we have more moderately resistant varieties available to select from. And I think the resistance that we're starting to see is getting better and better as, as we go through the years. But this is a very challenging um, uh, disease to work on, and resistance is, has been very difficult uh, to come by. So this is what you're looking at for those visual symptoms, tombstones, yield loss potential, and then here's that vomitoxin, the reduction of gone, and you can see the same sort of thing here. Those yellow bars, when you plant a moderately susceptible, a moderately resistant variety, you're going to be making headway in terms of the amount of disease or the, the amount of vomitoxin you get in your grain. So what I like to tell people is in a, in a bad year, in a very wet year, when we get these continuous rains around flowering, um, if you plant a susceptible variety, you're not going to be saving your uh, fungicide application isn't likely to save you. Um, but if you use a combination of a fungicide applied at the right time and a good moderately resistant variety, the likelihood of you being able to sell your grain, at least for that um, uh, animal consumption, is much higher than if, if you did nothing at all or just planted a susceptible variety and, um, and applied a fungicide. And that's what you're seeing here. When you have that combination of a moderately resistant variety right, way back in 2010 with our labeled fungicides, you can have upwards of 70% reduction in your vomit toxin relative to an unsprayed susceptible check. And even if you have a sprayed mo moderately susceptible variety, as I said, most of our our worst ones that we have out in um, production now would be considered moderately susceptible, you're still going to be getting, um, with that combination of the two, uh, only about 60% reduction with the combination of moderately susceptible and fungicide, where again, we're going to be upwards of 70 with that vomit toxin. Okay, and that's where we want to be. So if you had an unsprayed 
a susceptible, uh, susceptible cultivar and you're at 10 parts per million, you might be able to get yourself down to say three parts per million if we're, we're utilizing this data. So that's how you wanna kind of interpret this chart. Now we're continuing to do this research. There's new varieties, there's new fungicides, and there's also questions we have about fungicide timing. So um, this past year we had uh, studies that we conducted in L two sites in Illinois where we're looking at two varieties, the moderately susceptible and moderate resistant. And we're looking at um, Corumba, Prosaro, and a new fungicide called Miravis Ace. And we're applying these either at 50% head, so when half of those heads are just peeking out um, from that, that last um, um, collar of, of your wheat. Flower, which would be considered our optimum timing when those anthers are starting to pop out from about 50% of our main tillers, and then five days after flowering. And then we have uh, five replications for treatment combination at each location. We're ass assessing these for our yields, severity, Fusarium damage kernels, test weight, and vomitoxin. I don't have any vomitoxin for you right now because uh, that takes a little, little longer for us to process. But if we're looking here, what about some of these newer varieties and, and reducing the visual FHB uh, symptoms? So you can see here in our moderately susceptible or blue variety um, compared to our moderately resistant, we're seeing a significant reduction in the amount of um, bleaching on the heads as well as the fusarium damaged kernels and that's a, a pretty substantial reduction there going from 11 to maybe 7 percent um, in the visual symptoms and fusarium damaged kernel from 12 uh, to roughly 8 percent or less across these sites in these two varieties. What's nice when we do look at these data is that moderately resistant variety and I, I know you can't see this because I've, I've made the access um, 25 bushels per acre to to kind of show that there's not really a difference between the two statistically. So by planting, in this case, planting our moderate resistant variety, some, some, sometimes growers will have a concern that they're going to be losing yield, that there's gonna be a yield drag. And in this case, we didn't see it. If anything, um, it was as good, maybe even a little bit better numerically than our moderately susceptible variety. So that, that's good, good news. When we're looking at the different products and we're talking about the visual symptoms that we saw on the heads, our unsprayed check is on the right. And here are our three products. And anytime those little whiskers on those bars don't touch each other, that means they're different from one another. So in this particular case, um, Miravis Ace did very well for us across all those different timings. Um, what you will see, and this is something to keep in mind when managing head blight, that you are never going to get 0% disease uh, with this, this particular organism. You are going to be suppressing disease. So the idea here is how much are you going to suppress it? And by integrating that management, that's why you, you know, that's where it's at. You're really chipping away at part of the whole. So in this case, um, Miravis Ace, you still have about 5% severity on those heads, even though um, it's doing the best, you still have disease. When we look at the uh, FDK in this, in this particular case, you see there's actually no difference among the treatments. I actually think FDK is a more accurate visual measurement of disease caused by fusarium head blight because we're assessing each of those grains individually, uh, but they all were reduced relative to our unsprayed check. So all these products did equally well in that regard. When we look at our test weight, this is exactly what you'd expect. By applying these fungicides, they had higher test weights. In this case, Miravis Ace did a little bit better than our Corumba and Persaro treatments, but everybody did better than our untreated checks. And the same things here when we're talking about our yields. Okay, so we saw our yields go up from roughly 60, 69 bushels in our unsprayed check up to upwards of 77 bushels, um, 75 to 77 bushels in our Corumba and Miravis ACE treatments, which did the best in this particular trial. Now, what about our timings? Um, again, this is, this is kind of in line with, with older data using older fungicides, but uh, we didn't see an effect of fungicide uh, product in terms of one that did better or worse at different timing, but we did see an effect of timing. And when you apply early during that, that period when those heads are just emerging from the collar, uh, at FIX 10.3, we had the most disease severity. Really, we want to be getting in there at that perfect flowering timing, that FIX 10.51, or even five days afterwards, okay? 
And my, my typical suggestion is really trying to hit that five days afterwards if you can, because um, as we know, wheat never really tends to flower uniformly. There's also primary and secondary tillers. And so the primary tillers will flower, and then a few days later, you get those secondary tillers too. So by going in a little bit later, you're actually spreading out or hedging your bets that you're, you're going to be covering more of your heads at a period where they're going to be susceptible. So trying to get in at that flowering five days after the start of flowering window is really going to be um, critical for managing head blight. What about IPM for head blight? Tillage? Um, you know, bearing the inoculum, again, it's kind of like tar spot. You might see a local effect, but there's some data suggesting or indicating that only about 30% of the spores that, that actually make it up to the head come from local sources. And as I mentioned, some of those spores this fungus produces, about 70% of them are being launched into the atmosphere. They mix there, they can move miles. They're, they're thinking 25, 50 miles from a source. And then at night when things calm down, they actually are deposited and they rain down on your heads of your plants. And so as long as there's corn in the region, <laughs> which we have a lot of in Illinois, Wisconsin, you know, the Midwest, um, you still can have this disease regardless of how much tillage you have. And because it's such a narrow window of infectivity, um, that, that tillage is not likely to have a huge impact except in a year maybe where disease uh, potential is very low. One thing people like to do is actually plant behind soybeans, and we've seen pretty good results from that, actually. Eucerum um, gramiarum does not grow very well and doesn't sporulate as well on soybeans. And so you're able to still have residue on your fields and reduce the amount of local poten uh, inoculum potential by planting behind soybeans. That can be tricky sometimes, depending on, uh, you know, trying to get those beans out in time. But if you can, it's actually something that some of our growers really like to do, especially those in the southern part of Illinois and, and um, other areas where I've worked. Variety selection is huge. <coughs> you want to make sure that you're selecting a variety with moderate resistance to head blight. And you want to be utilizing our public resources to, to do this because our public sources are going to be conducting misted nursery screens um, where we're able to screen everybody's material all under the same conditions at the same time, maximize disease and vomitoxin data. Um, and that way we're not just using visual data where we might, uh, might be making the false assumption that something is, is resistant when it's escaping disease, or it might be relative to a particular company's uh, standard that they call resistant, which may not be as resistant as some of the other materials that we have. So I say go to the USWBSI, United States Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative, and Scab Smart web pages uh, to get recommendations for your particular growing area. Fungicides, our, our recommended fungicides are Corumba, Prasara, Miravis Ace, applied at that flowering up to five days after flowering. Um, and after, you know, after this point, or sorry, after, um, that's not what I want to say, before this point, you're not going to see the amount of control that you're going to get. So you really want to be targeting that five-day window there. The last disease I want to talk here, and I've got about 10 minutes to do that, I think I can, I think I can make it through this, is sudden death syndrome in soybeans. Um, this is one of our top diseases of soybeans in the last 10, 15 years, and we see some pretty major uh, yield reductions in, in seasons where growers are planting early, and then we get hit with a lot of rain early in the growing season. And why that is, um, I'll tell you here in a second. Now, this is caused by another fungus, Fusarium vergoliforme. It's not Fusarium graminearum, totally different species. So I mentioned that disease triangle you have to have the right species to cause disease, right? So this is Fusarium, but it's Fusarium brigoliforme, causing sudden death syndrome. It's a soil-borne pathogen and is favored by cool, wet conditions at planting. And that's pretty key here when we think about sudden death syndrome, um, cool, wet conditions at planting. It causes two different things. One is a root rot, which I think people forget about. So the root rot's gonna reduce growth, but also cause stand loss early in the season. And then later on in the season, it causes foliar symptoms. And it can per persist many years in the absence of its host soybeans. So if we think about our IPM management strategies, rotation, tillage, hmm, is that gonna work very well for sun death syndrome? What about the disease cycle? I have here on the right an example of the disease cycle. So what you have is you have this being established in, its, in the field as recalcitrant spores, 
and it's going to be overwintering for many years in the absence of soybeans. It can also overwinter inside soybean cyst nematode cysts, and that's one of our big pest pathogens that, that affect uh, soybeans as well. So you plant your soybeans into your field that has the SDS pathogen, and if it's, it's wet and cool, um, those spores will germinate, they'll colonize the roots. If they infect that taproot early in growth, it can actually kill the seedling outright, but it can reduce your root growth. Um, it also will kind of colonize and hang out in the lower part of the stem. And so as that plant matures, you get through the vegetative stages, you start you know, getting into the early pinning stages, R1, R3, you might not see anything. Um, but then you might get a couple of rains after that reproductive uh, stage. And when that happens, it's kind of interesting how this pathogen works. When you get rains after the reproductive phase, it actually will grow further into the stem and produce a toxin. And that toxin is water soluble and it moves up with the xylem. It will move up the stems into the foliage, following that transitory uh, pathway and accumulate in the tissues in the, in the foliage. And when it accumulates in the foliage, that's when it's actually going to burn your leaves off and cause these visual symptoms of intervenal necrosis um, and, and blighting. And the reduction in that canopy then is going to reduce the amount of photosynthates available for grain fill. And that's when we really start to see some major yield losses when those foliar symptoms come into play. <coughs> then after we harvest, our plants, okay, we, we harvest our plants and we, we put that residue back into the soil and that's where it's going to be overwintering. And basically once you have it there, it's going to be there for a long time, okay? It's going to be there for a while. Once you have SDS, you're managing SDS for, for some time after the fact. Visually, those, these are symptoms that you might see on the foliage. You see how those veins stay green and then inside the veins, it kind of becomes yellow or brown. And keep in mind, SDS isn't the only disease that does this. So it's gonna be very important that when you do see these symptoms, you go, you get out of your truck, your car, you go into the field and you actually get down on your knees and you start um, not, not praying, but you start sampling your plants and looking for, for some of the um, obvious characteristics that, that are associated with SDS. So it's often gonna be found in patches in these low-lying areas then you're going to go ahead and you're going to take out a pocket knife and you're going to split your stems and you're going to notice that that lower stem and the roots are going to be very brown but the center of the stem you look at this picture here that center of the lower stem is healthy and white so that kind of helps differentiate it from some other diseases that can cause similar foliar sim symptoms such as brown stem rot okay brown stem rot is brown in the middle that's not the case with SDS and if you're lucky and you have a lot of plants to look at, I'd say maybe one out of every 50 or 100 plants and it's wet in the morning, you pull those up and you'll see blue growth on the base of the stem. That blue growth is actually the fungus. And those are actually spores of the fungus, very distinctive for this particular fungus. That's a sign of the disease and that's kind of the um, aha moment when you see that in your fields. Going to be hard to find that, but those are what you're going to. Those are the things you're going to look for in your fields, not just the foliar symptoms. Now I mentioned cool, wet weather is a, a big part in terms of the disease, and a lot of our growers are trying to plant earlier and earlier in the year to maximize yields. So obviously, the earlier you plant, um, you're putting yourself at risk to have more issues with SDS because those are going to be conditions that that may be cooler and wetter than say if you planted on time. So what I'm showing you here are data from Kansas. And what we have are, in this particular study, uh, they planted two types of uh, varieties here, cultivars. They planted one that was moderately resistant to um, SDS, and that is the one that's green. And then they planted one that's moderately, or, or sorry, susceptible. Um, and that's the one that is kind of that bluish purple color there. And then they planted at, four different dates. They're early in uh, April and then they planted kind of that on time May and then they planted late in June. And if you look on the top, they're looking at the development of foliar symptoms over time. And you can see here that over time, those are, sorry, later in the season, I should say, those that were planted earlier in the susceptible cultivar 
had significantly greater amounts of disease when they're planted early in the season as compared to those that were planted on time later in the season. Okay, so they planted in their particular case that that kind of, I guess, June 10th planting is kind of where they were trying to, their sweet spot for planting. And then coming in, those earlier ones were considered considered early for SDS. So if we look at our yield, what you see is that across the board, the tolerant cultivar did much better. So it's protecting the yield caused by the losses that SDS can cause. So planting a tolerant variety is very important. But then also what you see here is that there's really no reduction in yield um, relative to planting uh, if, if you plant early in April 29th all the way through June 10th, it's kind of flat. So the uh, take home message here was that planting early with a tolerant variety may not really be um, buying you a lot of extra yield. In fact, it, it might not be doing much for you. So planting on time into soils that are warm will help get your beans out of the ground and help reduce the amount of disease that you're likely to see um, from SDS later on in the season. Variety is very important with this disease. In this case, we're looking at um, several studies conducted over multiple years in multiple states. Um, and here you see moderately resistant yield, moderately susceptible uh, yield, and then that's in blue. And our SDS visual symptoms in orange, different letters indicate statistically different responses. You can see here pot planting a moderately resistant variety, we're getting greater yields and we're also getting greater reduction in foliar symptoms. Seed treatments, there are several seed treatments um, that, that have purported effects on SDS, and this is one particular trial that we've conducted across states this last year. Um, but what you do see, no, sorry about that, everybody. What you do see is that these are the result FDX, are the visual symptoms, and you can see Alevo, anything that has Alevo, is reducing the amount of foliar uh, symptoms compared to some of these other treatments. And when we look at our yields, we have our untreated check there on the bottom, and the one that's going to be greatest, or the three that are greatest in terms of yield are those that have that Alevo product in it. That's a fungicide. It has a good activity against SDS and also some activity against some nematodes. Okay, so. If you are managing SDS and you have a history of SDS, what do you want to be doing? Well, you want to be planting on time, okay? You want to make sure that you have SDS in your field. So just because you see visual symptoms, make sure that you have it confirmed. And then you want to be selecting a moderately resistant cultivar that fits your, your production practice needs. And then considering a seed treatment. In the case of SDS, um, our group is still saying that Alevo right now is the best treatment that you can go with. Now you have to keep in mind Alevo is more or less specific for SDS. I know there's there's some data that I published um, on my blog and on the bulletin at Illinois where we did a study where we had Alevo alone and then Alevo plus a base fungicide treatment. If you have other pathogens in your field and you're just putting Alevo in, that Alevo isn't likely to give you much benefit. So you have like Pythium phytophthora, Rhizoctonia diseases like that, Alevo is not going to help you out, but it can help you out in terms of managing SDS. Now, in this case, I throw this up here. Why will tillage and rotation not work in this case? When I said it's going to be overwintering for a long time in the soil, so you can rotate out of soybeans for several years, you come back in, and the pathogen's still going to be there. So you'd have to be out of that field for maybe up, upwards of eight to 10 years before you actually start to see a reduction of SDS. So this is kind of something chronic where you have to manage it. But again, you, you can. You can make significant impacts on your uh, bottom line by utilizing IPM, including utilizing moderate resistant cultivars, planting on time, and seed treatments, Alevo, when you need to. Okay, so in terms of rotate uh, resources for everybody here, I think I'm finishing just on time, which is good. I had a lot of material here. Um, there's a crop protection network that's free information that our land-grant uni universities have put, in, uh, put together, fact sheets, information on diseases, uh, information on insects, weeds, that sort of thing. And um, we also have the plant management network. There's some nice webinars there on specific diseases and disease management coming from a lot of our scientists. So if you want to learn more about particular field crop disease, go there. And for head blight, I mentioned go to Scab Smart. All of our 
information. All of our studies have been summarized there. Um, variety selection, fungicides, cultural practices, things like that, all are available on our SCAB Smart website. And with that, I am at 11.10, so I, um, this will uh, conclude my talk. Thank you very, very much again for attending. And uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me at any time. Okay, great. Thanks so much for sharing, Dr. Klicheski. Uh, we do have time for Q&A, so we'll be accepting questions from the audience. We are going to give attendees one to two minutes to submit their questions based on response. So please enter your questions into the question box on your screen. We will be back on to answer questions in approximately one minute. about one more minute to send in questions. Okay, so we're going to get started with the Q&A, and the first question is going to be, we had many acres of soybeans planted in late May and early June due to wet soil conditions and cool temperatures. Temperatures warmed some in early June, but not a lot. Soil conditions remained wet through much of June due to additional rainfall. 
will the later planting dates in our area help lessen the potential for SDS this year? So SDS, um, uh, the, the cool temperatures, what, what we're, we're seeing with SDS is that when you plant in the cool, moist soils, what it's doing is it's reducing your ability of that, you know, your seeds to get out of the soil. Um, and the longer they're stuck there, um, the, the more opportunity the pathogen has to attack and cause disease early in growth and development. So um, the key is going to be getting those plants out of the ground and, and growing uh, rapidly. Um, what we do see is that in cases where even if you do plant into warm soils, if you get saturating conditions and it's very wet, that that actually still can result in significant amounts of, of SDS in your soils. Um, and so that's why in terms of management, uh, if you were thinking about the amount of reduction you're going to see by say planting on time, um, it's going to be taking a smaller piece of your potential pie out in terms of disease potential um, as opposed to selecting mild resistant a variety and maybe utilizing a seed treatment um, like Olivo. So uh, what I could what I can say is that you know you're going to have to look at your plants when they start to re reach that reproductive phase, R3 or later. That's when you might start seeing the symptoms, and that's when you'll really know um, how much damage you have this year. But I'd say you still have potential for SDS if that's the case. Okay, and the next question is, what was the top performing soybean seed treatment? The top performing soybean seed treatment in that particular trial, that are those trials that I was showing you here, um, are going to be, in this case, we had a, our, anything that had a Levo, a Levo alone, um, was providing statistically similar amounts of, in terms of reduction of SDS. And then that's also going to be um, those top three here in the uh, Alevo treatment. So I believe that one that was top in this trial, and, and again, I'm, I'm not sure because I don't have it here, it didn't show up for some reason, which is very strange, but I believe it was the Alevo bio ST combination, but, but I'm not positive on that. Okay, and the next question is, any new diseases or treatments coming down the road that we should be looking for? So one disease that I think we need to be keeping an eye out for, especially if you're in an area like that Kentucky, Lower Illinois, Missouri area, um, is taproot decline. Um, that is a very new disease that is really having a lot of fun down in the south. Um, it can cause some pretty significant yield losses. And again, we're just learning about that particular disease, so we don't have too much information there but in in places like uh, mississippi louisiana um they're they're really having trouble with that particular disease right now and that, that that's a completely new and unique disease um for for corn um bacterial leaf streak is probably something that you may have heard of more of a problem out in the colorado nebraska area um the dakotas i know it's causing problems over there uh, that's a bacterial disease uh, um, and they're starting to learn more about that. We do have that in Illinois. I believe it was confirmed in Wisconsin last year, really going to be favored by those kind of moderate warm temperatures and really heavy persistent rains. And it can be easily confused with say gray leaf spot or Northern corn leaf blight. Um, it's a bacterial disease, right? So applying a fungicide isn't going to, to help. And so uh, those, are, those are some that, that you probably should have on your radar, at least off the top of my head. Okay, next question is, with wet weather earlier this year, have you seen an increase in sudden death syndrome? So at least in Illinois, most of our beans are still pretty far behind um, and pretty short, and um, they're not at a point where we're going to start seeing sudden death syndrome yet. Uh, I would expect to start seeing some symptoms here maybe within the next week, week or so. Um, so most of our beans, similar to that first question, we couldn't get them in the ground, or if people did get them in the ground, they drowned out, and maybe they had to replant them. Um, so it's, it's really too early to tell at this point. All right. In the interest of time, I'd like to wrap up the Q&A. 
I want to thank you again, Dr. Klocheski, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work. Anytime. At this time, I want to recognize our Premier Egg retailer members, the Andersons, a gold member, and silver members, Gerti Egg and Nutrient Egg Solutions. Their contributions helped make this webinar possible and help promote the strides that egg retailers are making to reduce nutrient impairments. For more information on membership, contact our project manager at caitlin at partnershipfarm.org or visit our website and click Become a Member to fill out our online form. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge additional funders and collaborators that made this webinar possible. In particular, Field to Market, Spark, the McKnight Foundation, and the Great Lakes Protection Fund. If you are interested in sponsoring future webinars, please contact me at julia at partnershipfarm.org or visit our website. As we wrap up, please remember to look for the follow-up email in a few days with the webinar evaluation and webinar recording. If you submitted your CCA number at registration and are viewing this webinar live or the recording within two weeks of the original date, your CEUs will be automatically submitted. Only if you are watching the recording more than two weeks after the original broadcast date do you need to email julia at partnershipfarm.org your CCA number to ensure your CEUs are submitted. One last reminder to please take the webinar evaluation. The link to the survey is provided on this slide and will also be emailed to all registrants in a few days. The survey is a great way to let us know what topics you want to hear about on future webinars. I want to thank you all again for joining us today and hope you join us again for our next webinar in September.